our achievements and shortcomings as we traverse the trajectory of the crisis-ridden transformative process in our country. Permit me to take a detour in accomplishing this task as I intend to adopt a cultural perspective for analyzing and underpinnings of the transformative landscape in India since independence. Culture, as we know, constitutes the substratum of human life and society. So culture must blend not only into the political organization and into pursuits like science, literature, arts and religion, but also into the changing phases of production, circulation and consumption of commodities and thereby the transformative history of a nation. How should we, as Indian sociologists, reorient our approach to so social reality and its trajectory of development and transformation in the country? How does the nation overcome the one-dimensionality of modern science and technology <coughs> and develop a perspective that is integral and wholesome in approaching social development and transformation? What is the role of sociologists in the regeneration of an inclusive Indian reality? These are some questions that I seek to address in this presentation crisis of social transformation. When we trace the history of social progress in India since independence, it is to be noted that it was not only respectable, for it was a radical departure from the past and no worse than the performance of most countries, but also impressive and indeed much better than in most countries. We are interested in the economy of the nation because in the conventional development Intel framework, economic growth becomes a precondition for facilitating social transformation. Nevertheless, as a nation, India seems to have failed to transform this growth into well-being for all its citizens. So India's journey is development and social transformation may be viewed as an unfinished one. As long as poverty deprivation, exclusion, corruption, extremism, and the like persist. In fact, socio-political developments in India in recent years have often been articulated in terms of crisis. It is pointed out that the middle class, the predominant social category in, Indian, in India today, <coughs> currently caught in the whirlpool of consumer culture, is in the grip of a moral crisis too. And this moral crisis has to, with abandoning the Gandhian ideals of self-reliance and commitment to a course of development that includes the poor and the disadvantaged. One, 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 just, just one. Friends, you may not have heard properly, tea will be served here. So you don't have to go out. The President's lecture was scheduled after Vice President's departure only because there was a time problem. And President Lecture is the first and foremost function of the conference. So please, if you are going out for tea, stay back. Tea is going to be served here. And please, thank you, John. Please continue with the lecture. In fact, socio-political development in India in recent years have often been articulated in terms of crisis. So it is pointed out that the middle class the predominant social category in India today currently caught the whirlpool of consumer culture is in the grip of moral crisis too and this moral crisis has to with abandoning the Gandhian ideals of self-reliance and commitment to a course of development that includes the poor and the disadvantaged. Solidarity with the poor and the disadvantaged is incompatible with the president which is the present middle class orientation towards personal economic success and consumption. Capital is a necessary but not a sufficient condition of development. It means that human resource is equally important for the development of an economy. Too much emphasis upon absolute high growth rates in terms of income and industrial, agri industrial agricultural and ex external sectors along with poor growth of sectors such as health, education and environment will fail to sustain the 
high levels of development for a longer period. The socio-economic changes and the modern communication system have transformed the social values and social precepts of our, of our society. Individualistic man, fueled by non-rushing fires of materialism, has emerged on this scene and technology, both information and communication, has played a vital role in ushering in consumerism and materialism and this has resulted into self-affirmation, rising expectations and uh, loosening of the communi communitarian grip over the individuals. The new social man is more self-centered, self-oriented and self-seeking. Our quest for development and subsequent social transformation is not less government but good governance. <laughs> there appears to be a national crisis of governance in contemporary India. If we pursue, sorry, if we peruse uh, any published document, we find that India ranks very low in terms of productivity, transparency and governance. There is urgent requirement of administrative and bureaucratic reforms along with economic reforms. Elimination of corruption from public offices and government departments needs to be a priority of our decision makers. There are various sources that contribute to increase in corruption. The quality of life, human values, discipline, integrity and honesty, etc. are the factors which determine the commitment to nation, people and services. The increasing number of scams and highly publicized corporate scandals are examples of poor governance. The strengthening of public audit, accountability, better functioning of self, local self-government institutions, publishing the citizens' charters, spread of e-governance initiatives, and greater public-private partnership through NGOs are some of the appropriate ways of good governance and civil society. Therefore, it can be safely suggested that <coughs> the path of social transformation in India may approach only through proper legislative acumen, perfect implementation efforts, equitable judicial system, perpetuation of national interest by political actors, continuous cooperative attitude towards industry, faith in social responsibilities of the administration, eradication of corruption from public offices, and a wholesome reform process at different levels of governance. This may not only lead to overall development of the state, but also pave the way for good governance, which has become essentially the present day political world. Real, real, realizing the great need for a more informed discourse, and debate on this important issue of good governance, we have dedicated one whole symposium titled Crisis of Governance in this conference to discuss it. Furthermore, of late, extremism has taken deeper roots in the Indian soil, marking brutal and bloody spots in transformative map of the country. This is not merely a law and order issue. Development, or rather lack of it, often has a critical bearing as to exploitation and iniquitous socio-political circumstances on extremist tendencies, inadequate employment opportunities, lack of access of, to resources, underdeveloped agriculture, artificially depressed wages, Geographical isolation and lack of effective land reforms may all impinge significantly in, on the growth of extremism. As Indian sociologists, we need to dwell deeper into the critical problem haunting our nation. So the second symposium of this conference is on crisis of extremism. In a sense, the elementary function of the state 
of overall development of the citizens can be performed properly on by striving for the means minimization of inequalities. Therefore, the phenomenon of development is closely related to the concept of equality. Equality has been the mainstay of democratic governance. Even political systems that do not claim to be democratic reiterate their faith in programs for reducing inequalities. Disturbing aspect of India's development pattern is exclusion of marginalized communities. When the nation was undergoing rapid changes in development and planning, there were several areas that were interconnected that demanded sociologists' considered attention. These concerns have found relevance, especially in the post independent efforts at modernization and social transformation. The modernization process and consequent changes, in fact, demanded ethnographic studies on village practices, changing patterns of kinship, caste, family, and rural social structure. However, we are also aware of the fact that most of the time the regional discourses remained isolated and unaware of national level discourses. An effective linkage between the regional and national levels of sociological engagement was critical at this juncture, especially in the context of inclusive democracy. Hence, there were specific appeals for an increased collaboration and association between the regional and national associations of sociology. Translations of deliberations and discourses between the regional and national levels and undertaking the role of public intelligentsia that has been left to social activists and media analysts. The writings and discourses of the sociological conference in the 1970s proved the engagement with the modernization tribe. The 1990s marked the switching over of the Indian economy from welfareism to market economy. The currents of marketization have been sweeping the world at large and India in particular and the ramifications of this change on the political, social and cultural arenas, cultural dimensions of transgression of this period. So there were attempts to problematize the core concepts of nation and state from the distinctive social and cultural background of South Asia, <coughs> critiquing the positions and uh, uh, equate South Asian activities. With the, during the period of during the period of period of Indian sociologists have been concerned with the issues like civil society, globalization, governance, mobilization, science, technology and society, nation building and the like. With regard to the public sociology, it has been admitted that by and large, due to the disengagement with the social issues, sociology seems to have missed some important social processes like national movement. Sociologists seem to have played minimal role in the formulating policies or developmental paradigm uh, programs. More we have rarely contributed in drafting of bills of en enactments and seldom functional as social engineers. Rethinking sociology. In, in the final analysis, there needs to be a integration interdependence and complementarity between all our sociological endeavors in professional, policy, crit critical and public sociologies. In this context, the question that arises is whether sociologists can be content with description and analysis of interpretation or they should also get involved in policy making and implementation. Answer to this question has preoccupied the debates and discussions of sociology, although no consensus on this has been arrived at. We continue to introspect and be reflexive as to our deliberative task as sociologists in India. Quite a few sociologists have been engaged in 
critiquing developmental policies of the state from time to time, realizing that social criticism has always been a major function of sociology. At this juncture, we realized that public sociology should constitute the primary mission of Indian sociology in the days to come, as our Excellency has pointed it out. Public sociology, according to Buravoy, is nothing if it cannot, in the final analysis, bring about change, even if only indirectly. Now, if you consider public sociology as the primary constituent of Indian sociology, it calls us for rethinking of our basic methodological positions regarding objectivity and value neutrality. We need to ask whether the adherence to objective sociology and value-free approach has restrained the sociologists from responding to the pressing social issues of the day. The value-free method has invited criticism from many quarters and many sociologists have appealed for reconsidering the value-free position. In the context of equipping sociology to respond to the pressing concerns and needs of society depending on the contextual relevance, sociology in India have also proposed certain degree of value accommodation with uh, some ideological inclinations. It is, a fall, it is a fact that the sciences, including social sciences, have their object, not values, but facts. But the divorce of values from facts, of ethics from science, is the epistemic tragedy of the Enlightenment. Sociologists have a responsibility to bring together what modernity set us under. The efforts must be not merely at describing the facts concerning the Indian cultural formation, but also at evaluating them by the standard of their relevance for fashioning an egalitarian humane society, integrating the culturable dimensions of sociology. A committed sociologist is likely to have a threefold concern. One, the factual and the scientific. Two, the critical and the prophetic. And three, the exploration of the broad features of the kind of India we want. I'm concluding. We realize that the fact that as a knowledge system, society in India has definitely left a, sociology in India has definitely left a legacy in our, enga in our engagement with the social transformative process of, of the country. However, we also realize that the nature and dynamics of this very transformative process has been crisis ridden, begetting contradictions as it has been mostly born out of a mutual subversion of tradition and modernity. We also recognize that modern science, which claims to provide objective knowledge, but the world has been the inherent driving force of the modernizing projects of Indian <coughs> society. Engineering is transformative process in a crisis of riddle fashion. At this historic juncture as we celebrate the diamond jubilee of our professional existence it is time that sociology takes an emphatic turn for as Buravoi has put it it is our firm belief that sociology lives and dies with the society. When society is threatened, so is sociology. To this fact, ultimately, Indian sociologists have to engage in a twin, in a twin mission, intensify the committed public face in their sociological labor and further the growth of professional sociology. So accordingly, sociologists will have to play the roles of a theorist, a researcher, critic, and applier at the same time being true core travelers in the journey towards a humane, integral, and inclusive transformative process in India. So I
conclude by wishing you all a pleasant stay at Jawaharlal Nehru University and a rewarding experience at the 37th All India Sociological Conference. I am